The praying mantis, quite possibly one of the most terrifying insects in the entire insectoid family. Now, if you believe that they are cute, as is shown with this image, let me show you what I'm talking about. Yes, pretty horrifying. So the question is, as terrifying as praying mantises are, what is more terrifying? Perhaps an alien praying mantis. You know, one of the reasons why I'm talking about praying mantises is because there's an article written by Coast to Coast AM, uh, their news editor, Tim Banal. And as the article states here, cyclist in England claims he encountered a telepathic praying mantis alien. Something that we actually talked about not too long ago in a previous episode. It's, uh, it's really interesting and there's something to be said about this. I know a lot of people who may be new to the channel are like, dude, are you serious? Praying mantis alien? Like what's next? Bigfoot? Well, maybe. I actually think that there's something weird about Bigfoot as well, but we can save that for a different episode. A young man in England claims that he had a terrifying encounter with an extraterrestrial that resembled a giant praying mantis, which could communicate with him telepathically. The bizarre incident reportedly occurred this past summer, but only recently came to light when the shaken witness, Paul Frogat, Frogat? hope I'm pronouncing it right, decided to share his story with the media. According to him, the unsettling event unfolded one morning last July as he was riding his bicycle home from his job at a dog food factory in the town of Warwick. The routine trip took a troubling turn, he recalled, when he first spotted a UFO hovering in the sky. At first I thought it must be Venus or a satellite, he said, but it seemed to be much closer than either of these things, and after Fargratz had taken some pictures of the anomaly, he noticed that it began rotating. Uneasy about what he was witnessing, the young man fled the scene on his bike and ultimately wound up in a wooded area where he could no longer see the odd object. It's, it's strange. So many of these abduction cases, these uh, UFO cases, there was, uh, we had an episode about a guy who painted uh, these UFOs that he saw basically land. You know, you got the Randlesham Forest incident. You always see these incidences happening around forests. I even have this abduction video of, of a kid running in Pikes Peak, uh, it's a mountain in Colorado, and basically it looks like there's a UFO hovering over his house, and he's kind of running away from it, running towards the woods. So what is it with the woods, with the forest? Is, is it that it, it's isolated? Is it that it's easier to grab a person or, or is, is there something regarding discretion that these beings, whenever they do appear, that they make sure that there's not a lot of people around? I don't know, just an interesting pattern I've been noticing. So continuing here, thinking that the weirdness was behind him, Frogret was soon disabused of that notion when he turned a corner and spotted what I can only describe as a humanoid praying mantis. The young man described the curious creature as standing at least seven feet tall and possessing a triangular head and big oval black eyes. It had all the features of a mantis, but stood on two legs and had a somewhat human-like shape about it. Gobsmacked by the insect-like entity, Frograt simply stared into its eyes and felt as if he and the oddities were somehow communicating telepathically. Something else that you notice very common with alien abduction cases, people who apparently have encountered aliens, their mode of communication, whether it be greys, or in this case, praying mantis, it seems to be telepathic. I'm not sure how that would play with the reptilians. Maybe somebody knows more about it. I, I get this feeling that reptilians, I've heard both cases. I've heard of reptilians that have the ability to communicate telepathically. And some of them that have kind of like a husky kind of a, a, a kind of voice. I don't, know, I don't know if that was <laughs> that was a good imitation. But yeah, it's it's an interesting question to consider. You know, if aliens are real, 
do reptilians have the ability to speak telepathically as well? Frograt simply stared into his eyes and felt as if he and the oddity were somehow communicating telepathically. My fear was replaced with completely alien thoughts of utter hatred and evil. I felt projected from this thing, he said, recounting the chilling messages. Who are piloting these crafts? What do they look like? Or do they look like my praying mantis that I saw the other day that was eating the head of, of the male? That was, that was pretty bad. Unfortunately for the young man, his life had been torn asunder since the encounter with the presumed extraterrestrial. In addition to having difficulties sleeping at night, Fragret was forced to quit his job after he shared his story with co-workers and quickly became the laughing stock of the dog food factory. Say, I would say that's kind of typical by British people. You stop me again whilst I'm walking and I'll cut your fucking Jacobs off. Be that as it may, he insists that the incident truly took place and now hopes that someone can come forward to somehow confirm, at the very least, that there was a UFO in the sky that fateful morning. One thing that I wanted to mention was this quote up here that says, my fear was replaced with completely alien thoughts of utter hatred and evil. I felt projected from this thing. And, you know, I know a lot of people who might be new to this, you know, they're just thinking this guy's crazy that this is just a nutball who must imagine something and uh, I mean pray mantises I mean come on dude right well here's the thing right even before I read this article I wasn't surprised at all that he was quoted saying my fear was replaced with completely alien thoughts of utter hatred and evil I felt projected from this thing that doesn't surprise me at all because this is something that I've heard countless times regarding the Praementis cases. In fact, I've talked about the diamond UFO also having a very menacing quality. But when it comes to aliens, out of all the aliens, I would say that the Praementis is the one that people really have this enormous fear of from the things that I've read. So when I look at a case like this, I only have two options in, in the way that I think about things. I can either think that this guy is completely lying and he's making up a story and knows that praying mentis stories of aliens are that they are horrifying, that they project this absolute utter fear into others. Or I could think that this actually may have happened to this individual and that these are shared experiences that have commonalities with each other. So something that I wanted to bring back was, if you remember talking about Coast to Coast, Art Bell. Art Bell was a Hall of Fame radio broadcaster before George Norrie took his place in Coast to Coast. And he used to have this one guest named Jim Sparks. Well, you know, you know, Jim, after you described them that way, um, when you first described them, I thought, hey, why not just haul back you know, make a fist and knock one of these things clean across the room because they're little. They're four feet. I mean, so have at them. But the way you describe them and what they can do, uh-uh. Know me, I know you. You can't hide nothing from me. I can't hide anything from you, and nobody's hurting each other in that case. So it's... This Jim Sparks was, in my opinion, one of the most credible cases. It has to do with how many times he showed up. You know, I can't know for certain whether somebody's lying or not but when they speak enough times i worked at the ucsb social psychology lab i'm not exactly a deception expert but i know certain psychological tendencies and you can kind of get that sense when you process somebody's stories i mean given that they don't have a like disassociative multi-personality disorder i mean this guy came off as like a pretty normal dude when he was uh, interviewing with art bell and his abduction cases were just phenomenal. I mean, it wasn't just the amount of detail that he provided, but there was just this kind of honesty, you know, kind of like when you first hear Bob Lazar. And Bob Lazar has kind of kept his story straight for 30 years. And it's, it's, this is somebody else who I had uh, mentioned on this channel, even before Jeremy Carbell's uh, documentary, is somebody that I personally believed had credibility you know because my dad's a theoretical physicist and uh he just 
he had qualities like my father. He, Bob Lazar was like this theoretical physicist type dude. I don't, I don't know how to say it. It's like, it's, it was, it's like a certain personality that is kind of slightly withdrawn and, and doesn't want to believe in things that are not there. He just reminded of my father. I, I don't know how else to say it. And so when he said that he was a physicist, but nobody could draw records, I just started believing that maybe this guy is telling the truth because my dad is so similar in, in personalities to, to Bob Lazar. Now that's just a correlation, it doesn't really mean anything, but the point is that there are some individuals that when you hear them talk long enough, that they give you a sense of credibility. You can't prove it 100%, but what was so interesting about the Jim Sparks case was that he described being he described this mass abduction that happened in a forest the way that he described it was that there were all kinds of people that looked like they were suffering massive traumas some people were, were holding like rocking other ones were like walking in circles confused and they were just he said like a lot of people once again in a wooded area and then eventually three crafts came above he said and then they kind of blanked out and then were inside the craft, essentially. And something that was kind of interesting that I never knew before, but that Jim Sparks was very detailed in describing, is that whenever the aliens have a task for the humans to do inside this craft, they don't exactly lead it themselves. They kind of communicate with the human to lead the other humans, for example, to go to a room. And so in one case, he was describing how one person had been asked to lead all these individuals inside the craft to this big white room. And then they, he, he described like, like a kind of like a teleprompter, uh, not like a television, almost like a, a screen kind of thing that everybody, when they sat in their little chairs, that they had these screens in front of them. And that the screens started flashing images of Earth. He said at first it looks absolutely beautiful, like just, just beautiful earth images, crystal clear, no pollution. And also he described a, a sense of his emotions being heightened. So as he's looking at these images, he could really feel the deep connection to nature or, or to a certain form of spirituality. You know, it's just this, this very enhanced emotions. That's, I don't know how else to describe it. And as the images started going, they slowly got uglier, uglier with pollution, toxicity, and Earth just getting uglier and uglier um, by human activity, essentially, until at the very end of the slide, it, it looked so horrible that it was this very saddening experience. You know, and emotionally, of course, with your, your emotions being enhanced, you're kind of feeling this sense of like, holy shit, like, what is, you know, what, what do we do to this planet? And at the very end, it kind of writes in, I, I guess, English, you're killing your planet, you're killing your planets, or, or something to that effect. It, it was some kind of message that's saying that their planet is being destroyed. And, you know, you, you hear a story that detailed and you're like, wow, that, that's quite a, a elaborate story. That's kind of crazy. But then I remember that there was uh, these kids in Zimbabwe. I don't know if you heard this story. I, I'm sure many of, of the audience are familiar with this because it's actually a very popular story that has been to this day verified. These kids apparently, you know, they had gone to recess uh, in school in Zimbabwe and uh and then they all came running back in describing that this ufo landed and that these creatures came out and started talking to them once again telepathically and and it was a case that was really interesting because they had psychologists who studied the kids and who took each kid's story individually and not only did the stories match there was no indication that these kids were lying by by any means there seemed to be no motive the the stories seemed to be the same and um and what's even more shocking is that those kids are now adults and they still describe 
that what they saw in Zimbabwe, I think it was Rua, Zimbabwe, that what they described was was legit, that this was an alien that came down and talked to them telepathically. And what did the alien say to them? You're killing your planet. The same thing that I heard from Jim Sparks. That is kind of amazing in itself, the, the coincidences and, and the fact that this case in Zimbabwe is still to this day very credible because it's been analyzed by psychologists and these kids are now adults still saying that they experienced what they experienced. One of the th things that really kind of put that nail in the coffin for me and really got me to believe that alien abductions are real. I was watching uh, the Wii channel. The, it's the woman's channel. Um, and But I wasn't watching like because I watched the Wii channel. I was watching it because I was flipping through it. And I think they must have had this only for one season. I don't quite remember. But there was a show specifically dedicated to women about alien abductions. It did, I'm not kidding. This was a show on, on the Wii channel. And um, I only watched uh, one episode because I, I just it wasn't part of my normal programming. It's just something I kind of switched randomly. But I was really shocked because the woman started talking about a mass abduction, right? And she was being interviewed by a psychologist, very formal. And she started talking about this person leading other people inside the craft. And before she could finish her story, I instantly in my head thought, oh my God, don't tell me she's going into a white room. And <laughs> just like Jim Sparks, she describes going into a white room, looking at these teleprompters and being told that we're killing the planet. It's one thing to hear Jim Sparks talk about that notion. It's another one to have that Zimbabwe case, but then you get that that abduction case from the woman's channel. And once again, I'm forced to only believe a couple things when I when I see something like that. Either all these people are lying and they're all formulating the exact same detailed story from some kind of UFO Bible or God knows where they got this information. Or as Dr. Mack from Harvard once said, maybe these alien abduction individuals are telling the truth. Maybe we should be trusting each other a little bit more. So when I look at a story like this, this is why I have a tendency to believe that perhaps this might have happened. People don't just put themselves in a situation to be ridiculed for no reason. You know, I, I, something that's pretty amazing is of all the alien abduction cases that I've gotten in, in my channel, meaning people wrote pages and pages, sometimes providing actual pictures, sometimes providing, providing drawings of aliens that seem to match drawings of, that other people gave. And these people were unbeknownst to each other, describing very similar things. And nobody asked for anything. These people mostly wanted to be private. And so there was no motive to provide all this information, but ask for nothing in return. So yeah, ladies and gentlemen, if, if you wonder why I believe in alien abduction, well, that's it. Anyways, I think I've talked enough. So I guess I'll uh, leave it at that. If you have any abduction, alien abduction cases that you would like to share, please contact me at eafiles.contact at gmail.com. I will happily do another alien abduction video uh, so long as I get enough experiences from individuals that I could, that I could discuss on, on the channel. So once again, thank you so much for joining me. This is Felipe speaking, signing out.